a backward glance. time to time, people have asked me, shall I write any more ghost stories? And the answer is, probably not. I'm grateful for the fact that what began as a Christmas entertainment at my college has pleased a wider audience, but uh, I really cannot permit it to interfere with my more serious work. A man has just so much life at his disposal, hmm? I have a great deal to do before, <laughs> with every sign of reluctance, I become a ghost to myself. <laughs> Yet I confess to a sudden regret. Sitting at my desk with Artos, Artos is my sister's cat. Artos does not approve of ghosts. I discover so many unfinished ideas, notes for tales which of necessity will have to remain untold, and souvenirs too. This mask, for example, French silk, a fine piece, it dates from 1789. Did I ever tell you the curious affair of the mask? Wait. As I recollect, I had been bicycling in the Cotswolds. I was alone, having had a foolish quarrel with Anstey Guthrie, for the genesis of which escapes me. As night fell, I came upon a small town drowsing in a curve of the hills. Uh, excuse me, I wonder if you could tell me where I am? Uh, Chipping Moreland, sir. Ah, and uh, that would be an hotel at the bottom of the road? Oh, no, sir. That's uh, Chipping Moreland Museum. Oh. oh, you want the King's Head in uh, Norfolk Square or the Buckingham in the High Street? Thank you. Not at all, sir. I had no doubt that eventually I should require one or other of these establishments. But it was too soon to eat, I was not tired, and I decided to examine the local museum first. It looked old, not to say dingy. Through the window I caught a glimpse of stuffed birds, glass cases, and a number of indifferent paintings. I feared it must have been a bequest to the town from some worthy resident. The main room lay deserted, a fact which surprised me not at all. I have seldom seen a more depressing collection of ancient bric-a-brac. I glanced at a display of Etruscan coins. Putting on my glasses, I found they were quite incorrectly labelled. This annoyed me so much, I decided to protest. I knocked vigorously on the door marked private. Nobody came. I moved away. I played with the idea of writing a stiff note to the incompetent curator. Indeed, I had actually reached for my notebook when... Yes? Can I help you? Ah, are you in charge of the museum, sir? I am. Then allow me to point out... What's the matter? Why are you staring? Dr. James? Yes. <laughs> you have the advantage of me, I'm oh, oh, good Lord, I don't expect you to remember my name. I wasn't remarkable in any way, or even very good, I suppose. Uh, I beg your pardon. Nicholas Paul, sir. Reading classics in 1903. Rest oh, myself. <laughs> <laughs> of course, of course. Well, how are you, Mr. <laughs> Paul? Uh, what a delightful coincidence. Oh, it must be very hard, Dr. James. I do apologize. Oh, my dear fellow, what for? All the hundreds of men who passed through your college, how could you possibly... Oh, but you see, sir, you made a deep impression on us. Oh, why, thank you, thank you. Well, it's pleasant to hear you found my lectures instructive. Oh, it wasn't the lecture, sir. I was really thinking of your ghost stories. <clears throat> Were you indeed? Oh, dear me, I stand rebuked. But what are you doing in Chipping Moorland? Can I offer you a drink? Oh, that would be most agreeable. I, I hesitate to impose myself. Oh, no, myself. no, no, please. It will help, as a matter of fact. My wife and I, uh, my wife, we need company at the moment. If you'd care to follow me... Thank you. You live over the museum, then? Yes. It's an interesting collection, don't you think? Uh, my dear Mr. Paul, I don't think. I've hardly had time. 
You do realize you've attributed those Etruscan coins quite wrongly to 500 BC. Margaret! Margaret, we have a visitor. Oh, Nicholas, I, I can't... Good evening, Mrs. Paul. May I present the famous Dr. Monty James? Should I remember? Cambridge, my dear. The Provost of Kings. Oh. Please forgive this intrusion, Mrs. Paul. I'm on a bicycling tour and happen to pass the museum. Yes, of course. How very kind of you. We are rather proud of the Chipping yes. Orleans exhibition. It is good, isn't it? Remarkable. The drawing room is ahead of you, sir. Do go through. Thank you. You'll take a glass of sherry. And a biscuit. I'm sure we've got biscuits. I'll ask for them. Mr. Paul, I have no desire to inconvenience your wife. I think perhaps I should be on my way. No! The fact is, we had some rather distressing news this morning. My father-in-law has died in London. Oh, dear me. Then you have my sympathy. I will most certainly take myself Yeah, on. it wasn't a surprise. He'd been ill for quite a long time. Now, what has upset Margaret so is the business of the mask. I beg your pardon? You won't believe this. We were sitting at dinner last night when she heard, what we both heard, a sort of soft thump on the window pane. And there, peering at us through the glass, was a masked face. Good heavens. My wife screamed. Naturally. I take it some burglar. Yes, I suppose so. Well, we're on the first floor. The fellow must have been climbing up the drain pipe. Ooh, singularly alarming. I rushed downstairs, of course, and out into the street. The man had gone. But lying in the gutter, I discovered his mask. Excellent. That at least should provide a clue. Uh, you notified the police, I hope. At once. But what with that and then the telegram about her father, Margaret has been in a state of shattered nerves. Yes. Your visit is a most welcome distraction, Dr. James. <laughs> I should take it as a personal favor if you could stay at least an hour or so. Oh, my dear boy, anything I can do to help. So I stayed and drank some very inferior sherry and made a great deal of idle conversation. Mrs. Paul would have been a pretty little woman. Only the shock had produced a kind of desperate energy. She kept jumping up and offering me caraway biscuits, which I dislike. Her husband I suspected of being an academic failure. I learnt that some uncle had set him up in the museum. He struck me as a man of little talent and rather delicate health. Yet, how implacable are the bonds of social convention? Here was I, in somewhat tedious company, and I found it quite impossible to get away. Every time I rose to my feet, they pressed me back, and I found myself with another glass of sherry and two more caraway biscuits. Until, at last... Where are you staying, sir? Ah, yes, I have still to book my room. I really must be. Sure, me she can stretch the lamb. Evidently, they were afraid of being alone in the house. Perhaps the domestic staff slept out, and they dreaded a repeat visit from the burglar. So I suffered them to persuade me. It would have been too unkind to resist. And morning found me still in the chambers above the museum at Chipping North. Good morning, sir. Ah, good morning. I uh, thought you might like to see the cause of all this uproar. The mask? Yes. Interesting, don't you think? Yes, indeed. But surely this should have been given to the police. I and mean, forgive me, but isn't it evidence? I suppose so. It's certainly an antique. I couldn't bear to let it out of my sight. He had reason. The object he handed me was made of black silk. Beautifully worked. I put the period at late 18th century. Why some anonymous burglar should have been prowling about wearing such a valuable exhibit defeated me. Perhaps it had been stolen from a private collection. Oh, and one more point. Across the slits, which would normally have been left open for the eyes, there had been stitched something that looked like human skin. Well, what do you think? Fascinating, my dear boy. What are you going to do with it? Oh, put it in the museum, sir. I shall have to do a spot of research. I really don't know anything about costume. It was on the tip of my tongue to suggest he do his research first, and only then add the prize to his collection. Useless. He had already carried it proudly into the hall and was laying it out under a glass cover. Good morning, Dr. James. Good morning. I do hope you slept well. It should have been all right. I told Violet to wear the sheets. The sheets were admirable, thank you. I'm very glad you stayed. The daytime isn't quite so awful. My dear Mrs. Paul, if you fear another attempt at burglary, I should honestly put it out of your mind. To be frank, and please forgive me, there is very little in your husband's museum worth stealing. I know. But he had to do something with his life. 
What made him choose Chipping Moorland? We were advised to go somewhere quiet. He's got what they call a rheumatic heart condition, you see. He has to be careful. Oh, dear me, what a pity. It's all right. It's not as serious a condition as my father's. Oh, did Nicholas tell you he, he died two days ago? Yes, you have my deepest sympathy. He was in hospital in London. I, I suppose I should have been there, only I, I really can't leave Nicholas. I, I wrote and told him I couldn't leave Nicholas. Right. Shall we uh, go into breakfast? Oh, must we? I, I mean, I'm not sure if Cook is quite ready. Cook, ready or unready, had contrived to burn the bacon. We sat discussing my best route out of Chipping Moorland, which I confess I had become rather anxious to leave. You ought to take the east road down by the river. There's a magnificent view. Excuse me, madam. Yes, uh, yes, Violet. There's a gentleman asking to see the master. Mr. Eugene Borrowman. Never heard of him. Eugene Borrowman. Where is he? In the museum, sir. He walked right past me and he didn't state his business. Sorry. Never mind. Excuse me, I shan't be a moment. Nicholas. But... My love, I'm only going down to the museum to find out what this gentleman wants. Uh, perhaps you'd care to join me, Dr. James. Uh, I think my wife suspects a trap. Oh, come, come. Oh, surely not. Uh, but if you need my moral support... Curious name. Mr. Eugene Borrell. He stood at the far end of the hall, a large, full-bearded man with a cane. I had an impression of something indefinably foreign, though when he spoke, the voice held no trace of an accent. Mr. Nicholas Paul? This is Mr. Nicholas Paul. What can I do for you, sir? I have some acquaintance with your father-in-law. I have done business with him, in fact. I come at his recommendation. But my father-in-law is dead. Indeed. What melancholy news. However, it does not affect the purpose of my visit. You have in your possession a small item, a curiosity. I wish to purchase it. And, to our astonishment, he pointed to the mask. That? How much? Well, that's a bit of a facer, actually. I've, I've only just acquired the... Th How much? Dr. James, I have no idea, and I strongly advise you not to sell. You will tell me, please, whose property it is. It is mine, I assure you. I ask you, then, sir, to name your price. Oh, dear. Look, uh, could you come back later? I can't possibly put a tag on it till I've found out for myself... Just a moment, Mr. Uh, uh, Borrowman. Eugene Borrell. Would you be so good as to satisfy my curiosity on one small point? Well, how did you know the mask was here? It is on display. Oh, come. It has been on display for less than a quarter of an hour. So, so then I must consider myself fortunate to have discovered it so quickly. But you are asking us to believe that you walked into the museum at half past nine in the morning by some happy accident. I will pay fifty pounds. Don't sell. It's a little difficult, Mr. Bowman. I will pay one hundred pounds. For a scrap of silk? Don't sell. I find your attitude intolerable, sir. By what right do you interfere in a simple business transaction between gentlemen? Oh, dear, dear, dear. I see I shall have to invoke the majesty of the law. Mr. Paul found that object outside his house. It is by no means certain that he has undisputed claim to it. And quite apart from that... The mask may well be required as police evidence. It's not stolen property, Mr. Borrowman, but I'm not sure if I can sell it. Not even for two hundred pounds? Two? No. God in heaven, will you name your price? Mr. Paul, your wife is waiting at the breakfast table, yes. and I feel certain that Mr. Borrowman has pressing business somewhere else. Three hundred pounds. I'm sorry. I'd like to oblige you, but obviously I can't. Come back again next week. I can raise any sum you wish. I will pay you anything. Good morning, sir. I really am most frightfully sorry. Hell and damnation! Extraordinary fellow. What do you make of him, sir? A scoundrel, I'm afraid. More coffee, Dr. James? No, <laughs> thank you, no. I'm afraid Cook isn't very good at coffee. I should have ordered tea. Not I'll... at all. I never take more than one cup, I assure you. I have a theory, Dr. James. Mm? I do believe that man dropped the mask himself. Otherwise, as you so cleverly pointed out, how could he possibly have known where to find it? Oh, dear me. He's a burglar. I shall report the whole affair to the police. No, no, no. It really will not do. My dear Paul, if Mr. Borrowman owns the mask, what in the name of wonder could prevent him from asking for his property back? He's guilty. Of what, pray? Peering through your window? He must have been climbing up my drain pipe. Drunk. It would surely be the simplest thing in the world to plead intoxication. A masked rebel. 
There's absolutely no necessity to part with several hundred pounds. And since you've raised the subject, Mr. Borrowman is a rather large man. I gravely doubt if the drain pipe would sustain his weight. Nicholas. No, we shall have to look elsewhere for an explanation. Nicholas, there's somebody in the museum. What? Listen. Oh, God. Bless my soul, I heard a window break. Come on. The display case. Mine's it's gone. smashed. Oh, the mask has gone. What villainy is this? Borrowman. I can see him running down the high street. Father! Father! There he goes! Across the square! He's oh. going where you're going, mister! I, I beg your pardon. Oh, dear me. Stop me! Stop that man! Oh, too late! Oh. He jumped into a handsome cab! Oh. I can see another. Over by the church. Car! Cabman! Hurry! What's up, Governor? We've been robbed. The thief at the museum. Can you catch that cat disappearing round the bend? That is always a robber, is it? Hop in, sir. I do my best. Mm. Uh, take my hat. Yes. Oh. Oh. Yeah. Get up there. I beg your pardon, since I hurt you now. It's a little difficult to keep one seat. We'll never catch him. Faster, man, faster! My dear Paul, without wishing to interfere in the course of justice, I do feel if we go faster, the cab will overturn. Give me up, you spider! Oh, dear me, he's swinging right out into the country. Now these narrow veins. I'm scared to hit in the head, Governor. Keep going, we're closing the gap. Yes. Yes, I can see Borrowman now. He's got his head out of the window. He's staring at us. Nasty Ben coming up. Sit tight, Ben. No. Oh. oh. He took that corner at the most dreadful speed. Bless my soul. The carriage is swayed from side to side. It cannot be saved. We'll do it. One more push, Cabby. We're gaining on them. Oh, look out. Oh, dear God. Bloody oh. hell, I could have gone straight into that. Are you all right, Dr. James? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, don't worry about me. His bloody wheel came off. Please be calm. Let us find out the extent of the damage. Yes. I can see the cabman staggering about in the road. I can't see Borrowman. Quick, quick, he may have run off across the field. I think not. Hurry, he mustn't escape us now. There is no danger of that. Look beyond the hedge. I fear Borrowman has paid dearly for his crime. Here! Here! This fellow's broken his perishing neck! It was indeed a most appalling sight. The cab had run clean off the road, ending up on one side in the ditch. Borrowman, who must have been leaning out of the window at the time, trying to see how close we had got, was pinned underneath it. And he was, beyond help or question, dead. We did what we could for the cabby, who appeared to be in a daze, and made our way back to Chipping Moorland. Oh, Nicholas, how dreadful. Oh, try not to think of it, my dear. I do not consider we were in any way to blame. No, no. We were quite lawfully attempting to recover stolen property. And there's a mystery, you know. Where in the name of wonder has it gone? What do you mean? Is there something else? Yes. We had Borrowman under the closest observation from the time he fled from a museum, having stolen mask, to the moment he met his distressing end. He must have had the mask with him. As you say. Yet we searched the wreckage, we searched the roadway, the hedges, the fields around, and the mask has quite simply vanished. Is that possible? No. Suppose he had a confederate, sir. Where? Not in the cab, not in the street. He was much too carefully watched. Unless... And this is, I think, the only practical solution. Mm -hmm. Seeing we were about to catch up with him, he threw the mask out of the window. Oh, then it could be anywhere. Half across the countryside. Oh, dear me, I fear so. I think we are well rid of the horrid thing. But it's valuable, Margaret. Borrowman offered 300 pounds. More than valuable. Quite possibly unique. There is some curious enigma here. I would dearly love to know. Might I make a suggestion? Oh, please do. Advertise in the daily newspapers. Who can tell? Some laborer may have picked up the mask of farmhand, perhaps. Yes, yes, I should most decidedly advertise and offer a reward. Mm. And, Paul. Yes, sir. If you get any replies, do tell me. My address at Cambridge you have, of course, mm. and I shall be returning there in a couple of days. I took my leave of that depressing house. I hardly expected to hear from Nicholas Paul for some time, if at all. Yet... 
Within 48 hours of my return to Cambridge, he appeared at the lodge, looking distinctly puzzled. Mr. Nicholas Paul, sir. My dear fellow, you have news? I'm on my way to London, sir, but I took the liberty of calling as you were good enough to suggest. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Do sit down. Oh, thank you. Uh, not oh. on the cat. <laughs> Shoo! <laughs> I'm so sorry. My cat is singularly obstinate. Get off! <laughs> A glass of sherry. Oh, thank you. I've had an answer. Oh, capital. Oh, what very good news. You have found the mask? Oh, I'm not sure. No, thank you. I have received the most extraordinary letter from a lady. The thing is just not possible. Oh, surely. It is entirely likely that some young woman would pick it up. In London? I beg your pardon. Read that. Miss Kitty Kay. Mm. She seems to be a music hall artist. Appearing for a limited season at the Metropolitan Edgware Road. Dainty songs and monologues. She has enclosed a playbill for some reason. Oh, good gracious. Oh, dear me, the handwriting is almost illegible. <laughs> but her meaning is plain enough. A lively anticipation of benefits to come. I don't mind that. I'm prepared to pay. But can it be the same mask? According to her description. I know, I know. It sounds identical. But she found it in London on the morning of Tuesday the 14th. And we'd lost it. In Chipping Moorland on the morning of Tuesday the 14th. Odd. What do you think? The same as you, I imagine. It is possible, but it is very, very unlikely. <sighs> By what peculiar twist of circumstance? Yes. I'm going to London, on the off chance. Yes, do that. Oh, yes, I should. Uh, I have only a minimal acquaintance with the music hall, but uh, I must confess to a great curiosity. I wonder, might I accompany you? Oh, please do. The whole affair is so unaccountable. It grows steadily more mysterious. Can I help you, gentlemen? Yeah, I wonder if it would be possible for us to see Miss Kay. Miss Kitty Kay? Oh, there's a lovely artist. A lovely lady, too. Uh, yes, I have no doubt she is. Uh, would you be so kind as to take us to her? We wish to see her on a matter of business. Oh, in management, are you, sir? Well, I can get you both in for the second half. She does a very nice line in... Uh... Uh, dainty songs and monologues. Yes, I'm already aware of that. But our business with Miss Kay is of a private rather than professional nature. Private? Oh, I see, sir. Well, in that case, if you'd both come this way... Oh, thank you. Wait in here, gents. Miss Kay will be off in a minute. Thank you. Thank you. you know, I've, I've never been backstage before, though at one time I had some fancy to be an actor myself. Which you wisely abandoned, my dear fellow. I could not in conscience recommend anything of the sort. Oh, my stupid heart condition put paid to that. It's a quiet life in the country for me, whether I like it or not. Mm. A dainty song, I presume. Blimey, O'Reilly, who the hell are you? Miss Kay. There wouldn't be nobody else, would it, dear? It's my dressing room. I am Dr. James, and this is Mr. Nicholas Paul, with whom you have had some correspondence. Oh, yes. Now, isn't this nice? <laughs> so you're the one, eh? <laughs> How do you do? Uh, in the best of health, I'm happy to say. Yes. And you're the bloke for advertised. Precisely, madam. What's it all about, then? I did explain. We have lost a mask. Valuable? Uh, that is beside the point. Oh, is it, dearie? <laughs> <laughs> I don't agree. I'd have said... Uh, Yes, I definitely have said that that was the point, in a manner of speaking. It is of interest to a collector. Fancy. I took it for a prop myself. Madam, have you got it? Ah, well now. That the little beauty, is it? Ah. That what you mean, mister? And she threw down on the dressing table what was unmistakably a tripping moorland mask. It lay amongst the grease paint. The skin eyes stared blindly up, and the mirror reflected the black gleam of silk. Oh, thank goodness! No, you don't, Ducky. I want an explanation out of you. What's your little game, eh? I, 
I beg your pardon? If I wasn't amiable by nature, I could give you in charge. Strike me up the mob, but you've got a nerve. Peering through my window. Are you suggesting uh, that please. I... Uh, please, uh, Miss Kay. Miss Kay, be good enough to explain exactly how you found the mask. He knows. Upon my word, I don't. Uh, Mr. Paul may have some prior knowledge. I most certainly do not. Pray enlighten me. <sighs> well, we had a band call last Tuesday. Sitting in here I was, getting ready to do my rosebud number. I heard a sort of soft bumping noise, and when I looked round, Blimey, there's your precious mark, flat against the window, staring in. Good God. Yeah. Go oh, I didn't half scream, I can tell you. I screamed bloody murder. But when Bert ran out from the stage door, he couldn't find nobody in the alley. Just that flaming bit of tat lying in a gutter. Bless my soul, how that is strange. And I want compensation. What about me nerves, eh? What about the damage you've done to me act? I was all of a dither right through the first hour. I, I do assure you, Miss Kay, I could not possibly have been outside a London music hall on Tuesday morning. I saw you. You, you did not. I was in Chipping Moorland. And this gentleman can bear witness to the He's fact. your friend, ain't he? He would. Are you calling me a liar, madam? I will not stop you. A moment, Mr. Paul. If I might. Miss Kay, I must ask you to be absolutely frank with me. Have no fear of any consequences to yourself. Just speak the truth. And shame the devil, eh? Do you know a man called Eugene Borrowman? Yeah. You, you do? Borrowman. Lord help you, dear, I should say so. <laughs> Mr. Blooming Borrowman. <laughs> you were prepared to admit... No, oh, oh, proper case, that one. Proper calves are, Charlie, and no mistake. Fancies me no end, you know. Love everlasting, he calls it. <laughs> Been following me around for weeks. And the presents, my dear. Flowers, champagne, dinner at Romano's. Well, I mean, there's no point to say no, is there? But him, go. I wouldn't marry him. Why, he's foreign for a start, and he hasn't got a title, not even where he comes from, because I found out. I see. And did you uh, find out anything else? About him? Mr. Eugene Borrowman, yes. Well, I'm not nosy, am I? I'm sure it's none of my business. Oh, quite, quite. But I do hope you made a few inquiries. An attractive young lady in your profession has to exercise a certain caution. I'm sure you don't dine at Romano's with all and sundry. Oh, no, I do not. I've got my reputation, haven't I? Exactly. So you did make inquiries? Well, I may have asked a few people. And as a result, you dropped Mr. Bottleman? Well, it didn't seem kind to raise his hopes. Not really. Some things are meant and some things are not meant, in my experience. <laughs> Or if the gentleman's a friend of yours, tell him to cheer up. He'll find somebody else. I doubt it. He's dead. Hey? Five minutes, Miss Kay. Five minutes. Oh, God. It was with me, please. We left the dressing room at her urgent invitation. She wrapped herself in a violet peignoir and shrieked that Mr. Paul and myself were ruining her entrance. It appeared that the second performance was about to begin. I took hold of the mask. It felt cold and slippery under my fingers. I wrapped the thing in tissue paper. It smelt most oddly of grease paint and cheap scent. Paul gave the lady far too much money, and as we made our way along the narrow corridor, I could hear her singing. <laughs> And what, in the name of wonder, are we to make of that? She took me for a peeping Tom. <laughs> I felt she did. <laughs> a most remarkable young woman. A most extraordinary tale. Do you believe it? Do you? No, of course not. Lying hussy. She had the mask as a gift from Borrowman. Oh, dear, dear, dear. Mr. Paul. You have no grasp of logic, and very little sense of time. Well, she told us quite brazenly that Borrowman had been her lover. Ah, yes. It would have made no difference if he had been her lawful wedded husband, I'm afraid. You are left with the inescapable fact that she was in the Edgware Road, and he was 60 miles away at Tripping Marland. Oh, there's no proof that, that he was driving along a country road. Bless my soul. We stayed hard on his heels until the very end. Well, then, the, the, she was... was rehearsing at the music hall. We have the evidence of the lady, the stage doorkeeper, and every member of a rather large orchestra. The mask could not have been in two places at the same time. Agreed. And yet, oh, my dear fellow, and yet it was. Do be careful. 
I must look at the thing. He unwrapped the paper with a shaking hand, and the skin eyes gazed blindly at it. A small wind pursued us along Oxford Street, and gaslight flickered across the mast. I want so desperately to understand. Put it away. You are attracting altogether too much attention. <sighs> Lord, I wish my father-in-law had not died. Oh? He kept a small antique shop in Chelsea. He collected objects very like this. Might it be profitable to inquire? Oh, hardly. The shop has been closed down. There's nobody there. Oh, what a pity. Oh, dear me. That's curious now. Borrowman declared he knew your father-in-law. He was lying. I suppose so. My dear Paul, please don't walk so fast. May I make a suggestion? Yes? If you are really interested in the history of the mask, do try the British Museum. They might be able to help you. And I can give one or two introductions. He was reluctant to spend another day in London, being anxious to return to his wife. But... Urged on, I must confess, by the pressure of my own curiosity, I over-persuaded him. It would have been a thousand pities to lose the chance of consulting some real expert on the subject. So, having seen him safely bestowed in a modest hotel, I took my leave, promising to call at Chipping Moorland, explain what had happened, and assure Mrs. Ball that her husband would be with her again before the end of the week. But when is he coming back? Quite soon, Mrs. Paul, quite soon. It is not kind to leave me alone. Oh, my dear lady, I am certain you would not wish to interfere with his scientific research. Is it so important? <laughs> you think it's important, too? Yes, I can see you do. My father always put his work first, no matter what happened to... Yes? It doesn't matter. I do assure you, this affair of the mask is fascinating. Why? Well, consider the facts. Here we have a solid object which disappears from Chipping Moorland and reappears against all reasonable probability in the heart of London within a space of minutes. Now, I'm sure your own curiosity... No. No, come, come, come. Don't you want to discover the truth? No! I don't want to hear about it. I don't want to talk about it. I wish Nicholas were here. <sighs> I promise you he plans a very short absence. <gasps> I suppose I ought to give you tea. No, no, thank you. No, I am on my way to Cambridge. Well, uh, sherry or something. Um, oh, do let me pour that for you. Oh, thank you. It's all right, Chula. There's absolutely no cause for alarm. I had to spend the night alone, and, and now you tell me I've got to spend another night. Oh, come now, you're a sensible young woman. I love him. You are very recently married, I imagine. And he loves me. Of course, yes. But if I might offer a small piece of advice, I doubt the wisdom of two people being quite so dependent on each other. Why? Hostages to fortune. You're not married, are you? No. No, I come increasingly to believe that friendship is the main thing. I expect you find me rather silly and tiresome. Um, <laughs> is the sherry to your taste? Uh, excellent. Quite excellent, I do assure It was, need I say, quite abominable. Yet the gale troubled my conscience. It is not easy to abandon thoroughly helpless and incompetent women. I sat making idle conversation and devoutly wishing myself at home as the colour drained from the sky and the shadows lengthened across the room. Tell me about your father, Mrs. Paul. Oh, he kept the strangest collection of things. As a child, I used to be so horribly afraid. Bless my soul. Of what? The shop. Ah. No doubt it was full of uh, hideous carvings, hmm? Yes, they can be rather terrifying for a small child. I remember, as a little boy, being frightened out of my wits by Gog and Magog. <laughs> In London, you know, two large figures of the guilt hall. Yes. But I'm sure we've both outgrown any such nonsense now. Hmm? Uh, did your father keep an interesting collection of antiques? 
I don't remember. Oh, he must have shown you that... He kept telling me dreadful stories about them. I tried not to listen. They came from all over the world. And they all had... Oh, such fearful histories. Including the mask? Oh, please, Dr. G. Tell I... me. Did he have the mask? Yes. Ah? You have seen the mask before? Only once. I wasn't allowed to touch it. And the story? He would never tell me. Only that it was precious beyond anything. I see. Is it getting dark, do you think? Shall I ask Violet to turn up the gas? Allow me. I crossed the floor to adjust the smoking flame. And as I did so... <coughs> my hand slipped. And instead of turning the bracket up, I turned it out, plunging the room in darkness. But the curtains had not yet been drawn. And in the glow of the street lamp, I saw it too. A masked face peering in at the window. Oh, Lord, what's happened, sir? See to your mistress. She has fainted. I ran through the museum and out into the street. And even as I ran, I knew what I should find. An empty pavement, gleaming slightly through the mist, and on the ground, the curved outline of a silk mask. Is it them burglars again, it's sir? No, no. Get your mistress to bed. She's had a considerable shock. Uh, you have salva latterly, I trust. Yes, sir. It's the master being away. I said to cook, I said nothing but women in the house. No, it no, lapped again. You no, mark no, my no, word. Please don't alarm yourself. Uh, if it affords you any comfort, I am quite prepared to stay the night. It was most fortunate I did. For three hours later, we received a telegram saying that Nicholas Paul had had a heart attack in the reading room of the British Museum and died. No, no, no. Oh, she'll make herself quite ill, poor dear. Can you get some neighbor to help? There are surely local friends. Yes, sir. I can manage. Oh, good. Uh, I, I fear I must return to Cambridge. And, uh, Violet, concerning the mask... Take it away! Take it away! Take it away! Oh, oh, oh. And, after due reflection, I did. My investigation showed that Nicholas Paul, in full view of some 40 people, had collapsed across his desk and was dead before anyone could reach him. I took possession of the notes he had been making at the time. Fascinating. According to his research, the mask had been made by the celebrated Madame Le Normand, who practiced various black arts during the French Revolution. She had constructed the thing for a member of the aristocracy under sentence of death. According to legend, anyone who used it when on the point of dying would see for the last time the person they most loved. Borelman had told us that he had done some business with Mrs. Paul's father, and he must have learned from him something of the extraordinary reputation of the mask. It was in the nature of such an intense and somehow sinister fellow that the mask would have become an obsession with him. He would have had to possess it at any price. But whether to sell it again at great profit, or whether perhaps to test for himself its bizarre properties, we shall never know. Surely the story of the mask could only have been a foolish superstition. And yet, and yet, a number of highly reputable characters testified that as he fell forward, Nicholas Paul pressed the mask to his face. I do not myself subscribe to any such manifest absurdity. I have merely kept the mask as a souvenir. What else? Hmm? That was The Backward Glance by Sheila Hodgson, based on an idea by M. R. James, with David March as James. Nicholas Paul was played by Paul Meyer, his somewhat hysterical wife Margaret by Nicolette Mackenzie. 
The Sinister Eugene Borrowman by Douglas Blackwell, and Kitty Kay, the mercenary purveyor of dainty songs and monologues, by Carol Boyd. Violet, the maid, was played by Heather Bell, and the cabby and somewhat antique stage doorkeeper by William Edel. The play was directed by David Johnston. Unfinished ideas, notes for tales which of necessity will have to remain untold, and souvenirs too. This mask, for example, French silk, a fine piece, it dates from 1789. Did I ever tell you the curious affair of the mask? Wait. As I recollect, I had been bicycling in the Cotswolds. I was alone, having had a foolish quarrel with Anstey Guthrie, the genesis of which escapes me. As night fell, I came upon a small town drowsing in a curve of the hills. Uh, excuse me, I wonder if you could tell me where I am. Uh, Chipping Moreland, sir. Ah, and uh, that would be an hotel at the bottom of the road? Oh, no, sir. That's uh, Chipping Moreland Museum. Oh. oh, you want the King's Head in uh, Norfolk Square or the Buckingham in the Ice Street? Thank you. Not at all, sir. I had no doubt that eventually I should require one or other of these establishments. But it was too soon to eat, I was not tired, and I decided to examine the local museum first. The Backward Glance time to time, people have asked me, shall I write any more ghost stories? And the answer is, probably not. I'm grateful for the fact that what began as a Christmas entertainment at my college has pleased a wider audience, but uh, I really cannot permit it to interfere with my more serious work. A man has just so much life at his disposal, hmm? I have a great deal to do before, <laughs> with every sign of reluctance, I become a ghost myself. <laughs> Yet I confess to a certain regret. Sitting at my desk with Artos, Artos is my sister's cat. Artos does not approve of ghosts. I discover so many... It looked old, not to say dindry. Through the window, I caught a glimpse of stuffed birds, glass cases, and a number of indifferent paintings. I feared it must have been a bequest to the town from some worthy resident. The main room lay deserted, a fact which surprised me not at all. I have seldom seen a more depressing collection of ancient bric-a-brac. I glanced at a display of Etruscan coins. Putting on my glasses, I found they were quite incorrectly labelled. This annoyed me so much, I decided to protest. I knocked vigorously on the door marked private. Nobody came. I moved away. I played with the idea of writing a stiff note to the incompetent curator. Indeed, I had actually reached for my notebook when... Yes. Can I help you? Ah. Are you in charge of the museum, sir? I am. Then allow me to point out. What's the matter? Why are you staring? Dr. James? Yes. <laughs> you have the advantage of me, I Oh, good Lord, I don't expect you to remember my name. I wasn't remarkable in any way. Or even very good, I suppose. Uh, I beg your pardon. Nicholas Paul, sir. Reading classics in 1903. Oh, bless myself. <laughs> Of course, of course. <laughs> well, how are you, Mr. Uh, Paul? Uh, what a delightful coincidence. Oh, it must be very hard, Dr. James. I do apologize. Oh, my dear fellow, what for? All the hundreds of men who pass through your college. How could you possibly... Oh, but you see, sir, you made a deep impression on us. Why, thank you, thank you. 
Oh, it's pleasant to hear you found my lectures in Strat Oh, it wasn't the lecture, sir. I was really thinking of your ghost stories. <clears throat> Were you indeed? Oh, dear me. I stand rebuked. But what are you doing in Chipping Moorland? Can I offer you a drink? Oh, that would be most agreeable. I, I hesitate to impose oh, no, myself. No, 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 please. It will help, as a matter of fact. My wife and I, uh, my wife, we need company at the moment. If you'd care to follow me. <laughs> Thank you. You live over the museum, then? Yes. It's an interesting collection, don't you think? Uh, my dear Mr. Paul, I don't think. I've hardly had time. You do realize you've attributed those Etruscan coins quite wrongly to 500 BC. Margaret! Margaret, we have a visitor! Oh, Nicholas, I, I can't... Good evening, Mrs. Paul. May I present the famous Dr. Monty James? Should I remember? Cambridge, my dear. The Provost of Kings. Oh. Please forgive this intrusion, Mrs. Paul. I'm on a bicycling tour and happen to pass the museum. Yes, of course. How very kind of you. We are rather proud of the Chipping Moorland yeah. exhibition. It is good, isn't it? Remarkable. The drawing room is ahead of you, sir. Do go through. Thank you. You'll take a glass of sherry. And a biscuit. I'm sure we've got biscuits. I'll ask for Mr. Paul, I have no desire to inconvenience your wife. I think perhaps I should be on my way. No! The fact is, we had some rather distressing news this morning. My father-in-law has died in London. Oh, dear me. Then you have my sympathy. I will most certainly take myself Yeah, off. it wasn't a surprise. He'd been ill for quite a long time. Now, what has upset Margaret so is the business of the mask. I beg your pardon? You won't believe this. We were sitting at dinner last night when she heard, we both heard, a sort of soft thump on the window pane. And there, peering at us through the glass, was a masked face. Good heavens. My wife screamed. Naturally. I take it some burglar. Yes, I suppose so. Well, we're on the first floor. The fellow must have been climbing up the